Well, thank you for being here today with me for this is my final webinar of the year um, and decided to do the hot topics on food and cancer because there are questions I get often about these particular topics. I've written on them on my website several times, but I kind of wanted to just hit them all at once. So we have um, 10 different topics we're going to cover today. First, I'll tell you a little bit about me in case you're not familiar with me. So I am Actually, my new title is the Community Engagement Director for Cancer Services, so I guess I need to update that. But we are a community-based nonprofit in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I am a registered dietitian, a licensed nutritionist, and I have been um, working in oncology for, well, now even more than 15 years. Um, I'm the author of CancerDietitian.com, and I'm very grateful that Cancer Services, uh, the nonprofit I work for, helps to make sure that that website um, is paid for and updated and all those things so that you all can benefit from the programs at no charge. So that's how we pay for what we do, and hopefully you enjoy this webinar. For those of you who are on live, you can enter any questions in the Q&A or in the chat and I will answer those as I can. Um, let's see, so yeah, these are the 10 topics we're gonna cover today. And I'll try to breeze through them pretty quickly because we will be done in an hour. I never go over an hour, but that only leaves me five or six minutes per topic. Um, so if you do have a question that comes up as I'm talking about that particular topic, just drop that in the chat or the q and I'll keep an eye on it. If I can answer it right away, I'll do that. If not, I'll make sure to scroll through at the end and make sure I answer any of those questions for those of you who are on live. If you are watching this recording or listening to the audio on my podcast, which is the Cancer Dietitian Podcast, you can um, just send me an email via the contact page on my website, and I'm happy to uh, kind of either answer your question or point you in the right direction. So we will talk about sugar, soy foods, organic and GMO, raw versus cooked, carbohydrates, alcohol, grilling, anti-inflammatory, meat and dairy or vegan, and supplements. Those are the 10 topics we decided to cover as they are sort of the most commonly asked topics that I get um, as I've been, you know, working with clients and um, answering the contacts I get through the internet. So let's start. And each one we will structure as the false claim and then follow that up with the facts. So this is false claim number one, sugar feeds cancer. Hands down, top, most uh, sort of misunderstood uh, part about nutrition and cancer that I find from the general public. It's like almost everybody has heard this, but they're not quite sure. So I'm here to tell you that is not true. Um, the fact is that all of our cells, cancerous or not, use glucose for energy. Glucose is that basic building block of all carbohydrates, including sugar. And our body doesn't pick and choose which cells get what fuel. Um, someone is commenting that they can't hear me. So if anybody else is having issues with the audio, if you can let me know, that would be very helpful. Um, okay, so all of our cells, cancerous or not, use glucose for energy. We don't get to pick and choose. So I imagine in my head, people are thinking, oh, I drink Kool-Aid and all of a sudden that goes, you know, the sugar goes to the cancer cell and makes it grow. It doesn't work that way. Um, glucose comes from all the carbohydrates, foods that we eat and we need glucose, like glucose is a good thing. It helps to basically provide energy to all of our cells. We cannot live without it. Um, if our blood glucose levels get too low, then we tend to have lots of problems. <laughs> um, you can't live without them. So we want them in the right range, right? If those of you who have blood sugar challenges, if your blood sugar gets too high, it's not good if your blood sugar gets too low. And when we say blood sugar, we're really measuring the glucose in your blood. And glucose comes from all carbohydrate foods, not, you know, just sugar. So there's not, your body can't exactly tell once you've digested and absorbed carbohydrates, 
it doesn't know if the glucose in your blood came from a piece of whole grain bread or starchy vegetable or whether that particular glucose unit came from cake or brownies. Now, of course, there's lots of things that happen before it gets to your blood. But the bottom line is that once the glucose is in your blood, it's going to be used by your cells. And if you do have cancer cells in your body, yes, they will utilize the glucose. Um, but you have no control over where that glucose goes once it's in your bloodstream. It's just going around your body, getting picked up by all the cells that need it, including your muscle cells and your brain cells, which cannot work without glucose. If you don't provide your body with enough glucose through your food choices, then your body is forced to produce glucose internally, which is um, kind of, it's hard on your body to do that. You know, we're designed to be able to do that so that if we do a whole lot of exercise at one time and don't eat anything, then we have the energy for our muscles to work. It's designed so that when we go through a time of famine, you know, if you aren't able to eat kind of that starvation period, if there are, um, you know, times where we're not able to eat or don't have excess to food, then our bodies can produce glucose so that we can last long enough until we get to our next meal. Um, but that is not the optimal way for your body to have blood glucose. You're better off providing it with carbohydrates and other sources of glucose. So what people often ask me is, or they've been told is, oh, well, you know, sugar feeds cancer because when you have a PET scan, the, the, um, you, you have radioactive glucose put into your, into your body and the, uh, scan quote glows where there is cancer. And so people assume, oh, that's because glucose only goes to the cancer cell and that's where it's flowing. But that's not actually what's happening. Um, the cells are, all of our cells of our body use glucose um, the way cars use gas. So it's like the energy for your body. Normal cells use a reasonable amount of gas, but cancer cells are like gas guzzlers. So it's not the, that the rest of your body hasn't got the glucose, it does. It's the metabolism of the cancer cell that's burning it up so um, quickly that is glows. So it is true, the cancer cells do show up on a PET scan because they have that glucose, but glucose is going to all the cells of your body. It's just not being metabolized at a, a rate that shows up on the PET scan. So there's the answer on that one, certainly. I'm not telling you to eat, you know, processed sugar foods all the time or have sodas and sweet teas all the time, um, but you do not have to eliminate them completely. We can all find a good balance that's healthy for our bodies. And we will talk a little bit more about carbohydrates when we get um, to one of the other ones. All right, false claim number two, soy foods are not safe to consume, especially for those with breast cancer. The fact is that eating soy in moderate amounts, one to two standard servings a day, has not been shown to increase risk of developing cancer, including breast cancer. There have been plenty of human studies on even breast cancer survivors showing that soy foods have a positive benefit on your body. So our conclusion is that soy foods are good for you and are a great plant-based source of protein. They are a great source of dietary fiber and selenium, some soy foods are fortified with calcium, like soy milk. Um, so our, our rule, sort of general rule around this is to stick to soy from food sources, not pills or powders, or um, some of the protein bars are made with soy protein isolate. Because when you isolate things and you only have one part of the plant present, you lose the other beneficial nutrients that you would normally get if you eat the whole version of soy. So Examples of whole soy foods would be soybeans, soy milk, soy nuts, tofu, tempeh. Those are good choices for soy foods. And then I would stay away from any soy supplements, soy powders, like, I don't know if there's a soy protein shake powder kind of thing that you might use, or any of the protein bars that are using a lot of soy protein isolate. That's not my favorite, you know, it's not soybeans in there. You know, it's not because if it was, they would either look like these yellow ones here, which tend to be more toasted, or green ones. <laughs> um, so that is the, the lowdown on soy. The next false claim is that organic foods are better because conventional pesticides cause cancer. The fact is that eating organic 
um, or non-GMO, which is, I'll talk about that in a second. It's a personal choice. It's not necessary to have a healthy diet. So there's no direct studies on humans to show that eating organic foods prevent cancer or other diseases or that somehow it promotes better health. Um, and there's no consistent evidence that organic food is any higher in vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients. Organically farmed foods, they often still use pesticides. They're just organically approved pesticides, which may or may not be safer than conventionally approved pesticides. Um, when we highlight the GMO, so GMO stands for, I think this slide shows, GMO stands for genetically modified organism, or oftentimes we say GE or genetically engineered. Um, there's been 900 studies done so far on genetically engineered foods showing there's no cause for um, concern, that it doesn't increase allergies, that it doesn't cause health problems. Um, there's actually only 10 GMO approved crops, so there's not a lot of that in the food supply. Um, but the definition of organic means they don't use synthetic pesticides. Again, they may still use organically approved pesticides, which may or may not be safer than um, conventional pesticides. And I think it's also important to know that the EPA evaluates the safety of pesticide use and determines safe intake levels that can be used. The FDA makes sure that produce sold in the U.S. meets these safe levels. And when they review produce and check the pesticide residue, it's very, very low for any purchased produce that you find. Um, even conventionally grown, the amount of pesticide residue on the fruit or vegetable is extremely low. So that for you to get a too high level of pesticide from the produce that you buy at the store, you would it's not possible to eat that much of that food. <laughs> like it would be physically impossible to eat that many strawberries to get the um, negative effects of too much pesticide. Um, but then the USDA ensures that dairy meat egg products meet the same safety levels. So I've done a whole series on is our food safe in terms of, you know, these types of things. So if you're interested in specifics on that, you can go back and look. But essentially, the amount of pesticides found in conventionally grown food products are much lower than the EPA safe level. So I'm perfectly comfortable telling people if you want to eat organic, you can eat organic. If you don't want to or it's not available or it's not affordable, totally fine, perfectly healthy to eat your produce and foods that are non-organic. Um, and then GMO, I'm also perfectly comfortable with people consuming genetically modified crops that have been approved. Um, and that's the only ones that can be in the food supply. There is no GMO wheat. So if you hear somebody say, oh, there's GMO wheat, that's not actually one of them that's been approved. Um, so the thing is, though, if you're not comfortable with it, despite scientific evidence, that's still OK if you just feel unsettled about it. Um, you don't need a separate label for GMO free. Organic does not use genetically modified. So if you choose organic, it won't be genetically modified and that can help you make that choice. All right, uh, false claim number four, raw foods are more nutritious because cooking kills the nutrients. Um, I think that this one's really interesting <laughs> um, that some people will, they will say that. And then, I mean, I can't imagine eating all my food raw because some foods require cooking. Um, but I also find it really interesting when we start digging into the science and the nutritional science, the food science behind it. When foods are cooked, sometimes it activates nutrients and sometimes it deactivates nutrients. So I always say your common sense response to this is, okay, well then sometimes it's good to eat raw and sometimes it's good to eat cooked and you don't have to like keep up with which foods should, you should eat raw or cooked. Um, for the most part, if you eat, you know, cooked tomato products sometimes and raw tomato products sometimes, then you're going to get the perfect kind of variety and you won't have to worry about it. The other thing I'll point out in this, you know, for our population of cancer patients or those of you who are survivors but might be on some kind of maintenance medication that lowers your immune system, is that food safety is really extra important if you are immune compromised. And that's typically you would know, you know, you would know that because your doctor would say that to you or your counts would be low. Um, it's not a blanket statement that everyone in cancer treatment is immune compromised. And certainly once you're done with treatment, um, your risk tends to go back to the average person. We don't recommend, even if you are in treatment and immune compromised, we don't recommend a neutropenic diet any longer, um, which basically eliminated fresh fruits and vegetables. 
Um, but we do want people to be extra cautious with their food safety. Um, so making sure, you know, everybody we recommend fruits and vegetables should be washed before peeling. Even if you are immune compromised, you don't necessarily have to cook everything. You just want to be extra cautious about um, limiting the possibility for bacteria to be on there because your body is just not as able to fight it off. Um, so here's a rinse you can use. I do not recommend using soap or bleach or the commercial uh, sort of produce washes. If you want to kill some of the bacteria on the skin of the produce, you can mix one part white distilled vinegar to three parts water and then soak the produce for 10 minutes, rinse it, um, and then that would help if you uh, feel the need to do something extra. False claim number five, I should limit my carbohydrate intake to help prevent cancer. So this is kind of a popular thing, I say still going around or that has come back around. Um, for those of you who have followed diet trends for decades, <laughs> some of the same ones just come around and they're packaged in a different name. Um, right now, it feels like keto and low carb are still hanging around. And they're, they make lots of claims about how carbohydrates, you know, can cause harm. But actually, carbohydrates help make up what I call a super diet because they can give you great nutrition. Um, they are good for you. Carbohydrates, we've talked a little bit about glucose already, that your brain, your muscle cells, they run on glucose. And uh, so you need to consume some source of glucose, otherwise it adds stress to your body to have to produce the glucose internally. So the type of carbohydrates and how much you eat of them is what we tend to focus more on when we talk about a healthy diet. Low carbohydrate diets or zero carb diets often eliminate important nutrients and food groups. So that's why I'm not a fan. So a low carb or no carb diet would basically eliminate um, Meat, or they would eliminate dairy products like milk and yogurt. They would eliminate fruits, the whole food group of fruits. <laughs> you know, they would eliminate starchy vegetables. They would eliminate whole grains. And I find there to be a lot of beneficial nutrients in those food groups. Um, certainly things like simple carbohydrates. So we define something as a simple carbohydrate as if it has a lot of easy to digest forms of carbohydrates. Um, that can raise your blood sugar quickly. Uh, typically, those are things like table sugar, honey, maple syrup, other you know, high fructose corn syrup, especially, you know, if you consumed them in a version where there wasn't much else with that particular food item. So when you think about sugar sweetened beverages, those can be digested really quickly and easily and raise your glucose levels quickly it, especially if you're not having anything else at the same time to eat and sort of slow down the digestive process. So other simple carbohydrates are kind of, you know, brownies, cupcakes, cakes, um, white or processed, uh, you know, refined grain. Those are the types of things that we put more in the simple carbohydrate category, whereas the complex carbohydrate category will include less processed foods, whole grains, dairy, fruits, starchy vegetables like potatoes, corn, peas, um, legumes, like black-eyed peas or garbanzo beans or kidney beans. Um, and carbohydrates are important to reserve protein intake so that there's preservation of lean muscle because if the process of having to um, produce glucose for your body um, can burn up some of those stores. And you, if you have to, your body is going to use protein and that's not what we want. Um, having carbohydrates on your plate at every meal is a good idea. If you've watched any of my other webinars, they tend to uh, talk a little bit more about the plate method. So you can go back and watch one of my other ones. The plant-based diets for cancer survivors is probably a good one. Um, where I talk about covering a quarter or a half of your plate with um, carbohydrates. So if you have a quarter of your plate covered with some sort of whole grain or starchy vegetable and a quarter of your plate covered with fruit, then that means half of your plate has um, carbohydrates on. Um, so I think that's very reasonable amount of carbohydrates to have. Um, 
people who follow a zero or no carb diet um, tend to sometimes eat, overeat on the amount of protein they take in, overeat on the amount of fat. Um, and depending on how you do it, it can be very high in saturated fat, which is the not so heart healthy fat. Um, so that's why I prefer including um, a moderate amount of nutritious carbohydrates. All right, false claim number six, drinking alcohol doesn't impact my risk for cancer, which is not true because the fact is the less alcohol you drink, the lower your risk for cancer. Now, this is the recommendation from the American Institute for Cancer Research. The official definition of moderation when it comes to alcohol is no more than two drinks a day for men, one drink a day for women. You can't save those up for the weekend. Um, so, you know, generally I say if you don't drink, we're not going to recommend that you start drinking. If you do drink, try to minimize your intake of exposure to alcohol. So fewer drinks at a time, drinking fewer days a week, and drinking a lower ABV or alcohol by volume um, type of drink. Or you can try non-alcoholic beers or wines to see if you could kind of get that same, you know, fancy, I don't have a glass of wine without the exposure to alcohol. But certainly um, many people find a, a balance of moderation that they're comfortable with. There's strong evidence that drinking alcohol increases risk for mouth, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, liver, stomach, colorectal. So that's a lot of basically the GI tract right there that's exposed mostly to the alcohol and also increases risk for breast cancer. And alcohol is classified as a group one carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Um, so we know it does increase risk, but we're all balancing risks, um, you know, every day. So it's a matter of how often you're exposing yourself to that risk factor and what you're personally comfortable with and what are the benefits that you, you know, are there other benefits you get from this risk? Um, and always kind of balancing that. But I do like to point out, because many people say, oh, well, but I thought that, you know, red wine was good for your heart. But actually in 2019, which if you're not paying attention, that was, you know, four years ago, <laughs> the American Heart Association revised their guidelines and said that drinking red wine is not necessarily good for your heart. What is good for your heart is the phytonutrient uh, resveratrol that is found in the skin of the red grapes. And because they made red wine out of grape skins, they felt like the benefit of the extra resveratrol maybe outweighed the risk of alcohol intake, but it does not. Um, so I always remind people, you know what? You can get resveratrol by eating the skin of red grapes. So buy red grapes. Um, I live in the South and we grow muscadines, which are even more concentrated. The skin is extra thick. So eating the skin on the muscadines, which are bitter a little bit and sour, I like them. Um, but if you can eat the skin of the red grape, that gives you the benefit of resveratrol without the risk of um, the alcohol. Okay, so we are moving pretty well here. False claim number seven. I can't grill anymore because it increases my risk for cancer. So the fact around grilling is that it can uh, form potential carcinogens. Uh, that we'll, I'll talk about the specifics, but you, there are ways to grill meat, fish, or other foods um, by controlling the heat on the grill to decrease uh, the formation of those carcinogens. So uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or the chemical name, are present in the flame and can stick to the surface of meat, so that charred part. And the heterocyclic amines form in meat when proteins react to the heat of the grill. So think about if, you're, if the protein is getting charred, that's when these um, compounds are formed. And the more of these compounds that your body is exposed to, specifically your GI tract, the higher your risk for um, colon cancer. So we want to minimize risk. How do you do that? First of all, um, if you're grilling non-protein foods, it will not form those um, heterocyclic amines. So if you're grilling fruits or vegetables, which are delicious, you don't have to worry about that or vegetarian types of protein will not work, um, 
cause that issue. If you cut meat into smaller pieces so that it cooks quicker and it's on the grill for less time, then that exposure would be less. You can pre-cook larger pieces of meat and then just finish them on the grill so you get the grill marks, the grill taste, but without them having to sit there for such a long time. You can marinate the meat and that will provide a protective barrier around um, the meat that you're grilling so that it won't cause that charring. Or like what I do with um, fish often is put it in a foil packet, on a plank, or some way that pr provides a barrier um, for the meat from the flame. Now there is, um, someone asked, sent a question ahead of time about what if you use a George Foreman or my coworker uses a different, I can't remember what it's called, but a different kind of grill that basically doesn't use flame. So you're not going to get the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons because they're not, the flame is not present. If your meat is not reacting to intense heat, which um, again, with a grill, if it's a grill that doesn't use flame, the heat is probably not going to be as high. That will also reduce your risk. So using those tools to grill rather than a high flame kind of environment will help reduce that risk. So you can still get the enjoyment of grilling your foods without the risk. Okay, false claim number eight. Some foods cause inflammation and others are anti-inflammatory. The fact around this is that eating an anti-inflammatory diet is built on an overall consistent eating pattern with a variety of foods. So essentially, there's no particular foods that are pro-inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory. It's really more about the uh, pattern of eating that you have. Like, are you eating um, mostly uh, foods that are more nutritious that promote um, anti-inflammatory environment in your body. So I did get one question, additional question in about grilling. What about smoking meats? Um, so smoking, that's an interesting question, should not form the same uh, issues with grilling because the heat is not super high and you're not, the meat is not exposed to the flame. Um, I'm not certain about how smoking meats is in terms of processed, like when we say don't eat processed meats, I'm not certain if smoked counts as processed. I'm thinking no. Um, so it seems to me like smoking meats would be perfectly fine. Okie dokie. Answered that one. Uh, okay, so back to the anti-inflammatory versus pro-inflammatory. It doesn't have to do with any particular food. So it's not like, it's kind of like the sugar. I think people feel like, oh, I put this one food into my body and all of a sudden my body is going to react. There's no toxic, you know, foods per se, unless it's a food safety issue and you you actually consume some toxin. Um, it's the same thing. There's no foods you're going to eat that all of a sudden will like flare up some kind of inflammation in your body. Um, inflammation is just a natural response to injury. If you, um, you know, cut your finger, there's going to be inflammatory things that come in to help it close up, to heal, to scab over, all those things. Um, so inflammation is natural and, and perfectly healthy. Some inflammation is okay. What we don't want is sort of elevated inflammation just ongoing all the time. So when inflammation levels remain elevated, it promotes production um, of free radicals, which may cause damage to our DNA. Of course, there's no like, um, for sure, it's a very complicated process. Um, but what we think is that if more, if there's more free radicals and they cause damage to DNA, then more damage could in turn may, you know, push it to a point where you're growing cancer cells out of control. So what I always tell people is, again, it's not the particular foods. It's really more of an eating pattern that is um, more anti-inflammatory or maybe promotes a healthy level of inflammation. You know, the word anti-inflammatory kind of uh, suggests that you shouldn't have inflammation in your body, but some inflammation is normal and healthy. So maybe we should say a healthy inflammatory diet. Um, 
that helps your body to, you know, respond to injury without constantly being in a state of elevated inflammation. Essentially, it's a diet that's a lot of fruits and vegetables with a variety of different colors. It would include plants like whole grains, plant proteins like beans, nuts, and seeds, and then healthy fats versus the saturated fats. So more of the healthy fats that you would find in nuts, avocados, extra virgin olive oil, and other unsaturated plant oils, fish. Um, so that's the type of eating pattern that we want to see. It's the same thing that I talk about a lot in terms of, you know, Dr. Weil has an anti-inflammatory diet, but the same thing basically that my plate recommends or the American Institute for Cancer Research has um, their new American plate. The Mediterranean diet tends to also be anti-inflammatory. Um, and then the DASH diet, are those are all, I think, healthy eating guides um, that will promote a healthy level of inflammation in your body and help your body to kind of generally stay at a low level of inflammation until it needs to respond to something. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. False claim number nine, meat and dairy cause cancer. Therefore, I should avoid it and be a vegan. So the fact is that it doesn't appear that the vegetarian or vegan diets are any more protective than plant-based diets that include moderate to small amounts of animal foods. So I talk about this when I, when I recommend what type of diet or what type of uh, sort of eating habits to have on a regular basis is that a, the, the term plant-based diet doesn't mean eliminating meat. It means eating lots of plants. Whether you include some meat or dairy with your plants is your choice. You could be a vegan. That would be totally fine. And if you don't want to be a vegan, that's also fine as long as you're eating lots of plants. So not all animal foods are linked with cancer or all types of cancer. There's evidence for dairy and ovarian cancer um, in like one study. But again, one study doesn't tell us um, whether something's true or not. We want multiple studies. Uh, well-designed studies showing the same results before we can say, okay, yes, this is the recommendation we would make. So while there's evidence for that, or, you know, some studies here and there have shown, okay, well, prostate cancer may be not so good, but then it's helpful for, you know, it's been shown helpful for colorectal cancer. So what if you're at risk for both? And um, I think to me, when I look at all the studies that are done on nutrition and cancer, Generally, it's always coming back to not what, you know, you're not eating or eliminating. Oh, well, if you eliminate this, you'll be healthier. It's actually more about what are you eating and are you eating enough of those nutritious foods that we know will help promote good health in your body. So plant-based means you're eating lots of plants. So if you have dairy or meat, it should be fine as long as it's in moderate amounts and that you are still getting plenty of these phytonutrients, which is the basis for a cancer fighting uh, diet. Lots of antioxidants and other plant nutrients that are helpful for promoting good health. All right, so this is our last false claim of the day. Anyway, you guys can send me your other questions afterwards and maybe I can do a part two. Uh, but false claim number 10 is around supplements. So you know, some people will say, well, I don't feel like eating nutritious foods. I'll just take a supplement to get what I need. Or they'll be like, well, I'm taking all these supplements because it's good for me. The truth is that as much research as we do, um, good, well-designed trials on supplements pretty much consistently show that they're not that beneficial, that what's beneficial is getting nutrition met, nutritional needs met through diet as much as possible. Uh, most of the research on that supplement companies will sort of promote on their bottles are very small studies. They aren't well designed. They're funded by the, the supplement company. It's like 10 people and probably family members. <laughs> you know, the um, supplement industry just isn't regulated very tightly. So I don't trust the data that comes from supplement companies. You know, if they funded a study out of a university, I would also want to know that there wasn't a conflict of interest there or that the researcher wasn't, it was sort of blinded to things um, so that we knew there's not influence on that. 
So evidence-based research from the American Institute for Cancer Research. Their website is AICR.org. I recommend you bookmark it and get on their emailing list. I think they're great. They state, do not use supplements for cancer prevention because it's just pretty consistent that um, studies for people who consume nutrition supplements, especially if they're pretty high doses, do not promote good health um, necessarily over just eating a healthy diet and in some cases can be harmful. So you can't make up for a junky diet by, <laughs> you know, using supplements. And there is no such thing as a superfood. So a lot of times the supplements companies will say, well, hey, did you know like blueberries are good for you? So you should take this blueberry supplement. Well, the supplement's not going to have all the aspects of the blueberry. Otherwise, the supplement would look like blueberry because that's all the aspects of the blueberry. And we want you to get every part of the blueberry, not just one part of it. Um, so I will say the exceptions to this are, especially if you're in treatment or you're going through a period of time where your diet is not very well um, varied or you're not eating very well because you don't feel good, you don't have an appetite, you're nauseated, your treatments are really, you know, knocking you out and you're just doing the best you can, you know, getting your calories from maybe a less than optimal diet. Then, which is what I tell people, if all you can eat is a milkshake, then we need you to get something. Um, and in those cases, a multivitamin can be helpful. The other time that supplements are useful is if you have labs done and it shows that you are deficient or low in a particular nutrient. It is difficult to build those levels back up with your um, nutrition plan and just food intake. Once your levels are low, you probably need supplements, those high doses. So let's say your iron's low, your vitamin D is low, your potassium is low. You will need a supplement to bring it back up to normal level. At that point, you and your medical um, sort of team can figure out, do you need to keep taking that supplement or could you try to maintain it with diet? So the, those are the exceptions, um, but I don't recommend just taking herbs and supplements just because like there needs to be a reason and some sort of objective measure that you're watching to see if it's helpful. Okay. So another question came in, how about cured foods versus uncured food, uncured bacon versus cured bacon? Um, in terms of it being a processed food, I think it doesn't matter. Um, similar to things like sausage, um, that even the uncured or if they even use sort of natural nitrates, you know, there's still nitrates. So we don't count that as uh, a not processed meat. However, I have the same, um, which probably could have been like myth number 11 would be, I have to avoid processed meats. You don't have to completely avoid them. Similar to alcohol, we see that there is a threshold of increased risk um, with processed meats, it's hard to define that threshold. I think there, if you, if you look on my website, I've done an article about processed meats before, and I talk about there is one group out of the UK that kind of gives a little bit of a guideline in terms of what's a threshold that you would want to stay under. The American Institute for Cancer Research doesn't have a threshold. They just say minimize intake of processed meats. But again, that's it. It's not like eating bacon, cured or uncured, let's just say it's all processed. Eating bacon doesn't like all of a sudden mean you're going to get colon cancer or that that's going to have negative effects on your health. It's more about how often you do it and what type of serving size. So for example, with red meat, we know that increases risk, but we know the risk significantly goes up if you get past 18 ounces a week. So there's kind of a threshold. With the processed meats, there it's like I said, less of a clear threshold, um, and so I encourage people to find the balance that's comfortable for them. I think if you do something three times a week, it's a habit. If you just do it a couple times a month, it's more on the rare side. So um, I would tell you, you know what? Maybe you're somebody who doesn't drink alcohol, but you love some sausage or you love bacon. <laughs> um, finding kind of where the benefit versus risk is for you. Some people just don't care for processed meats. Some people don't want meat at all. You know, it's not a problem for them to go vegetarian or vegan because they don't like meat anyway. 
Um, so finding there, that's a little bit of a personal choice on that one. Um, also similar to the, to the, you know, when we go to the sugar issue, I'm not saying eat, eat as much sugar as you want. Um, but I think that most people can find a good, healthy balance if their taste buds are accustomed to like a moderate level of added sugars. Um, certainly having like ice cream every night might not be a great habit, but having ice cream sometime is okay. So I know that moderation is not an easy thing to figure out. <laughs> and um, I tend to, to sort of be an advocate for intuitive eating, where you are mindful about the experience of eating, you're paying attention to when your body's hungry, you're paying attention to when your body's full, you're paying attention to what your body is craving versus what's what it doesn't feel like eating, um, and then really responding to those things. And rather than trying to make any real hard rules about what, you know, foods you're allowed or not allowed to have. Uh, so that's a topic for another day. And I do have a webinar on mindful eating. Um, if you are interested in kind of learning more about that, it was from January, 2021, I think. Um, or 2022. So it's not too far back that you can find it. Let's see. Okay. So that covers our 10. If there's any other questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or the Q&A box. Otherwise, we're pretty much done with our topic. I will say that most of these hot topics have been covered on my website um, in one place or another. And the ones that haven't, we're going to be, we'll, we'll be updating some of the blog posts around these topics. We'll be adding them. Um, so make sure you're on my email list. I think probably most of you are. You signed up for the webinar. You probably found it via the email. Um, but if you want a fact sheet about sugar and cancer, if somebody is telling you sugar feeds cancer and you're trying to remember, what did that lady say, that dietitian lady say, you can go to cancerdietitian.com slash sugar and find that handout on that, a one pager. Same thing, if you need some data around soy to have a conversation with your medical team and just see what they think. Um, I have a handout on cancerdietitian.com slash soy. And then we'll be posting um, any updates or new articles on these particular topics on the hot topics category on my webpage. So you can always go to that. And if you want to watch, I've done webinars on um, carbohydrates. I've done webinars on uh, mindful eating, I mentioned. Um, a lot of these topics have been covered. Plant-based diets for cancer survivors is also, uh, I think, a really good basic one for most people. And that you can find all those topics at cancerdietitian.com slash webinars. Um, I mentioned AICR.org is a really great organization for evidence-based nutrition and cancer information. And then at the end of this month, I am kicking off my next winter edition of the Eat the Rainbow Challenge, where we'll uh, provide you with recipes and facts around produce and how to help you get more fruits and vegetables in a variety of different colors into your diet. And it's a 12-week email-based program. So I would love to have you join me. You can sign up at cancerdietitian.com slash rainbow. All right, last call for questions. Oh, there's one that showed up. Um, oh, okay. So someone pointed out that uh, today's topic's not on the program evaluation. If you see any other nutrition topics on the program list, I'm sorry, you're right. I didn't add this to that program and I can't do it right now. So if you see any other nutrition topics, you can just choose that. Um, thank you so much, Melinda, for uh, picking that up. And I'm glad you joined us. Um, anything else? Last call for questions. All right, that's it for today. Um, oh, any sample menus with recipes? You can go to cancerdietitian.com slash meal plan. And I think I have a sample two week meal plan there with links to the recipes. Um, I don't do a lot of meal plans because I find that what I like to eat isn't what other people like to eat. And then they don't necessarily follow them. So someone put a little heart. That was very cute. It came up on my screen. I don't know if you guys saw it too. <laughs> that was fun. 
Uh, okay, I think that's it for now. And if you have other questions or suggested topics for webinars, I would love for you to send those to me by email. Um, and make sure that you're subscribed to the Cancer Dietitian podcast and that you're signed up for the Cancer Dietitian email list. And I look forward to seeing you next time and hope you all have great holiday and new year seasons. We'll see you next year. Bye.